What's good, YouTube? It's your boy, Almighty Max. And today, we're back to the sad story behind Juice World's overdose, man. If you don't know who Juice World is, he's a legend in, in the music game. He unfortunately died a couple years ago uh, due to, like, an overdose on, like, on a plane or something like that. I never really knew the full details, so I guess this we're watching it now. And the reason I'm watching this shit now is because I've seen his ex-girlfriend, I guess. I don't know if she's an ex. They didn't really break up. He just died, but... His, yeah, let's say his ex. His ex-girlfriend was saying that, like, Juice World. They didn't really die of an overdose, and she was saying some some nonsense or whatever, you know what I mean? So, this just intrigued me to find out, like, what really happened the day he died. So, we're here. Roll to 10K. Uh, subscribe to the video, man. I just wanted to know if you should be put back 76 to Cabana Circle or to the Cabana Circle. Thank you. Thank you. On December 7th, 2019, Juice World and his entourage would begin to board a Gulfstream private jet that was located inside the Van Nuys Airport. The private jet would eventually take off at 8.23 p.m. PST, with its final destination being the Chicago Midway International Airport. The jet would be airborne for just over three hours before safely landing at the Atlantic Terminal in the Chicago Midway International Airport at around 1.28 a.m. CST. But little did Juice World know that the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, and the Gang Investigation Federal Task Force were waiting for them to land. After landing, Juice World and his entourage were confronted in the lobby of the Atlantic Aviation Building by three FBI agents, a canine officer as well as Officer Romero of the Chicago Police Department's Gang Intelligence Unit. Authorities would then immediately request Officer Mazzillo to have his canine perform a narcotic search on all of the luggage that was on board the private jet, which was already conveniently loaded on two separate luggage carts in the lobby. The canine immediately detected narcotics in the luggage on the first cart. Officer Mazzillo. The fact that they that they were even expecting this nigga, they had this shit ready with FBI. Was Juice World a gang member? I never really, like, I just listened to his music. I never seen him talk about no gangs or shit like that. Was he really? I know he's from Chicago, but I didn't know he was like into that life where he like he would have the feds after him. Would then take the canine outside, where it would later return to detect even more narcotics in the luggage on the second cart. Authorities would then notify Juice World and everyone else that was on board the private jet that the canine detected narcotics in the luggage and that the suitcases were going to be opened and searched. While the search was taking place, Ali Lottie, Juice World's girlfriend, would return from the bathroom and take a seat on the lounge chairs in the lobby with Juice World seated directly in front and to the right of her. Juice World would then slowly turn around to face Ali Lottie and let out a deep loud screech before throwing his arms in the air and falling to the ground. Juice World would then begin to convulse on the ground while blood leaked from his nose and mouth. Ali Lottie began to scream for help. Chicago police officers Michael Botica and Daniel McAuliffe would then claim to immediately start helping Juice World by rolling juice on his side to help with his breathing. Officer Botica would then call for the Chicago Fire Department while a Homeland Security Investigations agent gave Juice World two shots of Narcan. Officer Botica would then claim that after receiving the Narcan shots that Juice World would stop convulsing. Juice World was then transported to the Christ Hospital in Chicago by the Chicago Fire Department paramedics, while the authorities would uncover 41 vacuum sealed bags containing 70 pounds of marijuana Damn. and six prescription bottles of codeine. After the search, two members of Juice World's entourage were taken into custody by police. The first individual was a man by the name of Henry Dean, who was Juice World's personal security guard at the time. Henry Dean was never on the private jet, but was waiting for them to land at the Chicago International Airport along with a limousine service to pick Juice World and his entourage up in. After getting word that Juice World safely landed, Henry Dean would enter the airport to help everyone that was on board the flight with their luggage, but was quickly stopped by authorities. 70 pounds of marijuana, y'all think he was trying to sell it? No cap, though, a lot of these rappers look like they be selling, like, drugs and shit on the side, bro. Because, like, Fetty Wap got locked up for running a fucking drug, like, a drug, like, he was like a drug kingpin, my nigga, in, like, Long Island, something like that. Like, he was bugging out selling mad drugs. So, he got here with, like, I think, like, five years, something like that, which is crazy because, like, nigga, like, why are you doing that? I mean, I guess for Fetty Wap it makes sense because probably his music career died down a little bit. So, he invested money to the streets. But Juice World, that nigga was up. So, I'm pretty sure he had, like, a couple million so he, he was popping. He's still popping to this day, bro. Like, my little brother bumps Juice World. My little brother's, like, five years old, bro. Like, right now. So, it's like, he wasn't even alive. Like, he wasn't even, like, conscious enough to be able to know who Juice World was in his prime. And he's bumping him after his death. Authorities. Officers would then ask Henry Dean if he had any weapons on him, which he would inform them that he did, in fact, have two firearms on him, but has a valid firearms owner ID as well as a concealed carry license. 
Unfortunately, these licenses did not allow him to carry a concealed firearm inside an airport, and police eventually arrested Henry Dean on three charges relating to the firearms he had in his possession. The other individual arrested was Chris Long, Juice World's personal photographer and videographer. Chris Long was arrested after authorities discovered a bag containing camera equipment along with a 40 caliber pistol hidden inside. When asked who the bag belonged to, Chris Long would claim ownership of the bag but denied any knowledge of there being a firearm inside. Chris Long would then be arrested and charged with unlawful possession of a firearm at around 2.03 a.m. on December 8, 2019. A little over an hour later, Juice World would be pronounced dead by Dr. Sean Motsney at 3.14 a.m. The cause of death was later revealed to be oxycodone and codeine toxicity. Everyone else that was on board the private jet was free to go without any additional charges. But what about the 70 pounds of marijuana that was trafficked over 2,000 miles across the country? It was stated that neither of the suitcases containing the vacuum-sealed bags had any name or personal items that could be linked to any of the passengers on the jet, and nobody claimed ownership of the suitcases either. But why was it even on the jet in the first place? Juice World was a rich and famous superstar. Exactly. Why would anyone put Juice World in that position in the first place? Regardless, the feds weren't just going to let drug trafficking slide, right? After looking further into the police report, something odd stood out to me, and that was the fact that the Gang Investigation Federal Task Force was waiting for them to land. I can understand that if the pilot called in a tip stating that there were narcotics and firearms on board, why the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, and the police being there. But the Gang Investigation Federal Task Force seemed strange and oddly specific. I began to do more research where I eventually discovered that just six days before Juice World's sudden overdose, the Chicago Tribune released an article claiming that the FBI is in town to investigate the death of a Chicago rapper who went by the name of Shooter Shells. Shooter Shells was a member of a Chicago gang called Black Mob and back in 2017 released a song on YouTube titled Death of 150 which was a brutal diss to a rival gang. The rival gang targeted in the song goes by the name of No Limit, with its most well-known members being rappers G Herbo and Lil Bibby. Lil Bibby is also the owner of Great A Yeah, and, and Juice World was signed to Lil Bibby. Makes sense now. Productions, a record label Juice World was heavily involved with since its start and would later sign onto a multi-million dollar joint venture deal with Interscope Records. Now, while most Chicago gang members are known to be some of the most savage individuals, Lil Bibby was different, with his main focus always being money, and was known as a big-time drug dealer who rarely dissed opposing gang members. When the Chicago drill scene started to gain traction online back in 2012, names such as Chief Keef, Lil Durk, G Herbo, and Lil Bibby were some of the biggest in the industry. Juice World, who grew up in Homewood, Illinois, a Chicago suburb just 30 minutes south of where Lil Bibby is from, became a huge fan of the drill scene. And when Lil Bibby showed interest in Juice World, he signed him almost immediately despite having similar opportunities to get into the music industry. After signing, Juice World, who had no gang ties prior to meeting Lil Bibby, was now acting as if he was a lifelong No Limit gang member and began involving himself in very serious situations that and that's what happens bro these rappers bro a lot of these niggas really is professional cappers bro and i don't want this juice world because the niggas dead bro but these niggas like they get it's like the tupac effect man they got two y'all know about tupac bro feel me the nigga growing up was a, a theater kid feel me nigga wrote poems you know i mean he was an actor and stuff like that good guy right all of a sudden, he links up with Suge Knight and these niggas. Now he's the biggest blood. You know what I'm saying? He's dissing niggas and shit. He's talking crazy. Talking, you know what I mean? Like, bro, like, just because you... Like, these niggas really start believing what they what they rap, my nigga. Like, bro, like, you're rapping. I get it. But, like, that shit's make-believe, my nigga. And just because you hanging around these niggas don't make you one of them niggas, bro. Just be yourself, bro. It's cool to be yourself. That's why one rapper I used to respect, and I'm losing respect for the nigga every day now, was Kanye West. Because when Kanye got into the industry, he just knew that he was just the kid with the backpack and the polo. He wasn't no gang member, none of that. But now the nigga is talking crazy. He's talking about his GD. And he's talking about some racist shit. My nigga, the nigga is racist, bro. So I can't respect the nigga no more, bro. Uh, unfortunately, feel me? It had absolutely nothing to do with him. For example, Juice World would start dissing a guy by the name of Posto. Posto was a member of a Chicago gang called Lakeside, which rivals No Limit, and was brutally murdered back in November of 2013 at just 18 years old, after being shot in the head while standing in the first floor hallway in a building located on the 2700 block of East 80th Street in Chicago. And on my wrist is a glass house, smoking pasta to our pass out. What you say about pasta? This is a dirty ass house. 
Juice World would also diss another No Limit rival who went by the name of Lil Mister. Lil Mister was a well-known Chicago drill rapper and a member of a Chicago gang called Wooga World. On March 15, 2019, Lil Mister was fatally shot in the head after a drive-by on the 7400 block of South Harvard Avenue. He was only 24 years old at the time of his death. We said we smoking on ghosts, smoking on Katie Peck and Pasto and Mister the most. Man, <laughs> I'ma kill you, know it though. In addition to all that, Juice World also began to drop rakes, which is a gang sign used to disrespect anyone affiliated with the gangster disciples. And we dropping them bitches and we phone. <laughs> <laughs> Most of these subtle yet very serious expressions of disrespect would go over the heads of the majority of Juice World fans, but fans of the Chicago drill scene would immediately take notice and criticize Juice World and No Limit. Nah, niggas really got a Reddit page dedicated to Cyrac Coonery, my nigga. And it's crazy because these niggas on the Reddit page is not the niggas outside, bro. It's the niggas indoors, the little nerd niggas. Online. One Chicago drill specialist by the name of Rasha947 would comment, Nigga has a degree in Chirac. Wow, this is actually shameful. How are No Limit letting him do this meal ticket or not? Straight clown. He would be on this sub if he wasn't famous. Another drill superfan by the name of Throwaway8881 would say, Herb, Cairo, and Bibby are some clowns for letting him do all this. A now deleted user would respond to that comment with, It's gotta be awkward these savage hood dudes pretending to vibe with him just for money and clout when he's clearly some soft suburban dude and him trying to pretend he can relate to their savage mentalities. These situations are prime examples to show the lengths Juice World would go in order to fit in with the No Limit Street Gang. Now, going back to the narcotics found on Juice World's private jet, fans have been speculating on several theories since the day it happened, with a common one being that the narcotics found on Juice World's private jet were for personal use and were most likely being brought from California to Chicago to be given out to the guests at Juice World's 21st birthday party that was scheduled on the that day he unfortunately passed away. Another theory being discussed online is that Juice World's girlfriend, Ali Lottie, was the mastermind behind all of this, with the evidence being leaked court documents claiming that Ali Lottie was arrested for trafficking meth back in 2017. Ali Lottie denied these claims on Twitter by tweeting, Never seen meth ever, and I'm pretty sure meth is Adderall. Again, this paperwork has nothing to do with me. I'm so sorry. I don't even know the lawyer. Fans would also speculate that... Fuck all that. I don't know if she did it or not, but y'all seen the shit she was doing recently, my nigga? Yo, bro, that's why with the shit that happened with the Queen Vaughn shit, my nigga, I remember when, when Asian Doll was talking about she was Queen Vaughn, and then uh, now I seen some shit about Juice World's girlfriend, bro. Yo, this bitch then gave her new boyfriend, who's a Juice World fan, Juice World's Rolex to wear, you know what I'm saying? And like she started her only fans, and she's out there, like, you know what I mean, just naked and shit. Like, she's just tarnishing this man's name, bro. And the same thing with Queen Vaughn. She got this nigga King Vaughn tattered on her hand. And she probably giving niggas handies they coming on King Von's name and shit, bro. Like, the disrespect. That's why, bro, I don't know if I could tell my name to a female no more, bro. Because, like, after I pass, bro. We, actually, I can, but it's got to be the right female. Because after I pass, bro, she got to, like. I'm not saying she can't get to a new relationship. Not that. Because, obviously, the nigga is life. You know what I mean? Niggas move on and shit like that. But what I'm saying, like, just do it in the most respectful way, bro. Like, we haven't seen Kobe Bryant's wife while out. I'm pretty sure she got a new nigga by now. You know what I'm saying? It's been a couple years since Kobe died. She, she's moved on. But we're not seeing this shit publicly. We're not seeing her bug out, my nigga. She's still holding a respectable name to Kobe. You know what I mean? She's still respecting Kobe's legacy, bro. And like, that's what you know I mean. Chris Long may have Somebody's something to weird, do bro. with this due to his ties with the underground cannabis industry in Los Angeles. This is Chris Long, the plug. Royal Buds LA is a store that sells medicinal marijuana. Yes. And you're the manager. Who owns it? Or can you talk about that? Some guys own it. So you really can't talk about who well, owns okay. it. I'm not going to. Okay, that's the fair. weed this business. Is a business shady. Where I, love, I love the weed information yeah. is kept close they to the chest. Yeah. Um, but basically, he works for some dudes that own a lot of them. Like, he works with them, and they are fucking. How'd they find you? Shit. And others, more specifically the Chicago drill scene, would speculate that No Limit was behind all of this the whole time, with one highly upvoted comment in particular stating Juice World was getting extorted, even though some people like to deny it. Another user would respond shortly after saying, Thank you. Why would Juice World be traveling on a jet with so much weed? No Limit was using him as a crash dummy. He just so happened to be a superstar. We will likely never know why and how the situation came to be. But at the end of the day, 70 pounds of narcotics were found in the luggage on board the private jet, with the gang investigation federal task force in particular waiting for Juice World and No Limit to land. Am I
R.I.P. Juice World, man. Feel me? He's really a legend. He made great music. So he made a couple bad decisions so like that, but hey, man. If you're new, drop a like, subscribe. Roll to uh to 10K sub. They didn't really say how he died. They're like, yeah, I know he overdosed, but like a lot of people are saying that he panicked and took the from what I, the rumors that I heard. Like they're saying he panicked and he just like down the fucking pill shit. But I don't know. Like I wish he would have gotten to like how he actually died. Like I know it was an overdose, but like what did he do to overdose? You know what, I'm saying? what did he take? But if you're new, drop a like, subscribe, roll to 10K. It's your boy Mighty Max, and um, I'm out.